Now, do you remember, when we were looking at simple harmonic motion, we looked at this idea, we, we saw, okay, things do this, things do this. What kind of function would, would give us this kind of behavior? And then we went through, we differentiated from what we resulted in, and we got out of that a differential equation, a really important differential equation, which may, which define simple harmonic motion. Don't write this down, but what was that equation? Very, very simple. X double dot is equal to what? Yeah, very good. Minus or negative n squared x, right? So in other words, your acceleration is proportional to and opposite whatever your displacement is. Okay, so this was crucial. In the same way in projectile motion, we have a set of equations for acceleration. I have to have two. Why do I have to have two? Because I've got two axes of motion, right? And I want to think about them separately. Okay? So I want you to go right back to our first sentence. Since there's no propulsion, right? In projectile motion, nothing is making this go quicker. I throw it with that initial velocity, okay? And then it just keeps on moving through. So what is making it faster or slower horizontally? Nothing, nothing, nothing horizontally. Because we're not thinking about propulsion, we're not thinking about air resistance either, which is what would slow it down because it's running into air. Because we're not thinking of anything of that sort, there is no change in the <coughs> horizontal velocity, okay? Now, this is really interesting. Since there's no change in horizontal velocity, this is your acceleration equation, horizontally speaking. But vertically, something very different is happening, right? Because gravity is pulling this object back down to the ground, okay? And it's pulling it at a constant rate. So we say, because it's pulling down, it's a negative. And then g will be defined as one of two things, basically. It'll either be 10 meters per second per second, or it will be the other common number you'll find is 9.8 meters per second per second. Whichever they want you to do, the question will define. Okay, but we might as well put over here on the right hand side. It's usually either g equals 10 or g equals 9.8. Okay, I think you'll find 10 much more frequently um, just because it results in easier numbers. Okay. So, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a situation much the same way that I gave you these. So this is going to be example three coming up. And from here, from these two, and just your initial piece of information, like say this, right, which is very, very little data, okay, I can get all six of my equations of motion for projectile motion, okay? So, let's start with some initial conditions. Let's say, this is example three, you've got an object, I'm going to say, just because this is our first like proper example, I'm just going to fire it from the ground. But often you'll hear it you know, fired from a height. You know, it's been raised. The, the object that is firing this object is up high. Or you might be firing from down low and trying to hit something that's at, at sea level or ground level or whatever it is. So initially, uh, fire from the ground. And I'm not going to give you all of the, um, the words, the fluff that will usually surround this, they will say someone throws a ball or, or a cannon fires a shell, but all of those things are the same. What really matters is the equations of motion. Okay? Um, and I'm going to say at, let's just go with some easy numbers, 30 meters per second, 30 degrees angle of inclination, which we remember we measure from the horizontal. And let's go with the simple number of g being 10 meters per second squared, okay? All right, now, first, let's get the equations of motion. It always starts with getting these six equations of motion. And because every single projectile motion question relies on these two ideas, right? It's projected, so it's not getting faster or getting slower. And it's under the force of gravity, so you've just got this, right? I'm always going to begin with these two, and I'm going to get everything else out of this information, right? Let's go with the um, horizontal first. So if you've got x double dot equals zero, I want to climb up the ladder to get to my other horizontal equations of motion. So to get to x dot, what do I have to do? I'm integrating, right? Um, I've started from the bottom in terms of the, the highest derivative, so now I'm going to go up and up and up. Now when you have zero and you integrate it, you just get a, you just get a constant, right? Now keep in mind, where I'm starting from is here, uh, sorry, wrong way, here, I'm going to go here, and I'm going to have to, to get to the next step, I'm going to have to 
integrate again, yes? Mm -hmm. And in exactly the same way, after I'm done with this horizontal business, I'm gonna have to start here, and then I'm gonna have to integrate again, and then I'm gonna have to integrate one more time. How many integrals is that? Four. Four. How many of them are definite integrals? None of them. None of them. So I'm going to get four constants of integration. Okay. So get ready for them to fly around. Be that there are going to be four, I'm going to call this one C1. Okay. Now at this point, obviously I want to work out what this constant is before I go any further. I don't want to have lots and lots flying around. How do I work out what the horizontal component of motion is? Diagram. Yeah, you see I have this on the board, right? This is not just by accident. I know the initial speed. There it is, right? And I also know the angle of inclination that it was projected at. So I, I, I can use these. Now, I am going to use the formulas, but at the same time, I would like you to draw the diagram. It helps you, number one, understand what's going on. Number two, help you make sure you get the, the formulas right, because at this initial stage, we're still not... You know, we're not very familiar with them. Yeah. So why do you draw a box instead of just a triangle? Um, yeah. You'll see why in a minute. Because, um, I mean, the short of it is I want to make sure it's oriented, right? At the moment, all I'm showing you is this first instant in time. But there are other instants in time that I want to draw. And um, it might not be going in that nice neat direction. For instance, it might be dropping, which is what I'm going to have a look at later. Yeah, so I just want to make sure like it's not just a triangle hanging out in the middle of nowhere. I just want to I want to show that this is a particular snapshot in an instant of time, right? In much the same way that like do I need these parts of the axis over here? Not really. Like I I need this shape. This is the important part. And this is just kind of fluff, really, but I have it there so I have a frame of reference for the entire object, okay? Um it's not like you're going to lose marks if all you draw is a triangle, but I think it's a helpful way to do it. Okay? Right. So, I'm going to draw my box. You can see I'm drawing it pretty wide because... Well, can anyone tell me why I'm drawing it pretty wide? Because my angle of inclination is 30 degrees, right? So it's going to be pretty flat. Like so. That's my 30 degrees. I've got 30 meters per second here, going off at its angle. And now I'm going to work out x dot and y dot. So you can see here, x dot will be v cos theta, because it's this horizontal length, in this particular case is 30 cos 30 degrees, right? Cos 30 degrees is root 3 on 2. So this is going to be 15 root 3. Yep. And exactly the same way, y dot's going to be not 30 cos 30 degrees, but 30 sine 30 degrees. We already rehearsed sine 30, that's just a half, so this is just 15 meters per second. Okay, so I'm going to use each of these. This is just my initial condition, right? So at t equals zero, before I've progressed to this situation, I already know what the horizontal component of motion is. x dot is equal to 15 root 3. So when you compare these two equations, that constant must be 15 root 3. Okay, so that's not too complicated. So therefore, x dot is 15 root 3. Okay, I have started with acceleration, it was predefined. Velocity I integrated once, what am I going to do now? Integrate, integrate again, okay? X double dot, x dot, so now finally x is going to be equal to... 15 root 3t Which makes sense because... Because if I want to know the position at any given time, just horizontally, right? I just pump in, like, oh, after three seconds, I've moved that about, and remember that velocity is not changing, yes? So it'll be 15 root 3 meters the first time, and then double that the second time, and triple that the third second, etc. Okay. So what am I going to do here? How do I resolve this guy? Yeah, I'm just going to define stuff to begin at the origin, right? You don't have to define things at the origin. If it's convenient, you might like to start um, above or below zero, but it just kind of depends on the question. Um, at t equals zero, x equals zero, so therefore my constant is going to render out to be zero. Okay, uh, And that's kind of the point. This is a little bit like um, when you were doing simple harmonic motion, you would often define, you'd pick sine or cosine based on where you were starting. When would you pick sine for simple harmonic motion? 
Cosine. When you begin at the center of motion, when would you pick cosine? Yeah. When you're starting at an extreme of motion, and if you're starting somewhere in between, doesn't matter. In the same way here, I'm choosing things such that these constants here, they end up being zero. The way that you, you choosing sine and cosine made the phase zero. Does that make sense? Do you think you could get your equations for vertical acceleration, velocity, and displacement? Why don't you have a go? You're going to start here. Y double dot. Because we've defined g to be 10, we're going to write minus 10. Why don't you have a go? See how far you can get. Yeah. 